the second offer of the Austrian tradition that uh, helps us with understanding Bitcoin is Hayek mm -hmm. and his take on um, what prices actually are. Mm -hmm. And uh, my probably all-time favorite uh, piece of writing on economics is his uh, The use, use of Knowledge in Society. Oh, I love that paper. Yeah. yeah. Where he explains that uh, prices are like um, the most elegant way for us to coordinate, to share knowledge in between each other with the uh, least amount of necessary information, with the yeah. least amount of information. It's yeah. just uh, just a digit. Yeah. Just, uh, just the price. It's like the ultimate form of data compression. Right. right. Yeah. In terms of moving knowledge or preferences around the world in just one number. Yeah. Versus a story or words or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Joseph Tatek, welcome to the What Is Money show. Hi, thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you here. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, you are a Bitcoin analyst at Satoshi Labs. You're a podcaster and you're also an author of this book, Bitcoin, The Separation of Money and State. Um Maybe before we dive in to this book and the chapters and talk about some of that, could you give us just your quick background and path into Bitcoin? Sure. So I'm an Austrian economist uh, by background. I actually studied that in university. Okay. Well, um, I was quite lucky to have uh, proper university teachers that uh, actually educated me in economics, uh, didn't propagandize any Keynesian economics and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So uh, we are at... Uh, Mises Hayek wrote Bart at the university, and a couple of years after that, I discovered Bitcoin. And um, yeah, that's like why I wrote the book later, because uh, Austrian School of Economics and Bitcoin is very uh, compatible. Is, uh, yes. And I believe Austrian economists have been uh, searching for a way to separate money from the state. Yes. And for a long time, it seemed like uh, we need to return to the gold standard. But uh, Bitcoin is actually a much uh, better suited tool for that. So that's like why I wrote the book. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the sly roundabout way we've been looking for, right? For a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So I guess you probably understood Bitcoin pretty quickly, given that you had an Austrian economic background. So did it click for you immediately once you were exposed to it? Later than, uh, uh, than I'm happy. Yeah. But um, yeah, I 
first heard about Bitcoin in like 2011 on an uh, Austrian economist, uh, economics podcast. Mm -hmm. And it took me until maybe 2015 mm -hmm. uh, when I started to really pay attention. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, when Andras Antonopoulos came to Prague, mm -hmm. to Hackers Congress, uh, and gave a speech about why Bitcoin matters, that's when it really started to click for me. Yeah, he got a lot of people orange-pilled, I'm right. pretty sure. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm looking at your book now, going through uh, the table of contents, and let's just talk about this. The, the first chapter is titled, The Austrian School of Economics. What does it have to do with Bitcoin? So right. let me pose that question to you. What yeah. does the Austrian School of Economics have to do with Bitcoin? So the Austrian analysis of money and uh, what uh, the fiat, type of money does to an economy, um, basically directs us to look for ways to separate money from the state. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, for example, Ludwig von Mises, uh, it's almost 100 years now that he uh, started to work on the Austrian business cycle theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he says that uh, when the central bank or some uh, authority of power intervenes in the monetary system, typically nowadays to um, lowering the interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the money spreads in uh, the economy unevenly. It's, mm -hmm. not, uh, it's not evenly distributed. Right. new money that comes into the system through debt, through debt issuance. And this uh, causes uh, speculative bubbles. It uh, causes a come to own effect where you basically rob from uh, the poorest and mm -hmm. uh, give the money to the richest. And uh, it creates this uh, business cycle that uh, some economists explain as a natural tendency of uh, the market economy. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mises and other uh, authors of the Austrian tradition point out that uh, the central bank is the culprit of these business cycles. And you can actually consult history, uh, for example, George Selgin and other uh, authors of uh, the free banking school uh, did that uh, historical research where they showed that before the emergence of central banks like the Fed, uh, the business cycle, it was there like uh, for, uh, it was partially seasonal mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the economies were more ag agriculture based before, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the severity that we see now for the past 100 years. Mm -hmm. And it's actually funny that uh, the Fed uh, was supposed to eliminate the uh, business cycle. Right. It was part of the uh, propaganda back in 1913 and before that. Uh, but if you uh, look at FRET, like uh, the statistical tool of uh, the Federal Reserve, you can see there, there has been almost or around 20, uh, 20 recessions for in the past 100 years. Mm -hmm. So that's like uh, one every five years. So mm -hmm. the business cycle didn't, uh, didn't disappear anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, on the contrary, we, had a, we have a much more severe uh, crisis, uh, like the Great Depression, then in the 70s, the stagflation, mm -hmm. the dot-com bubble, um, the, the mortgage crisis, and yeah. now like this, uh, there's this like everything bubble. Yeah. And I believe uh, the only uh, school of economics that properly explains uh, this, uh, this, uh, this problem is the Austrian school. Right. So that's Mises and the Austrian business cycle theory. The second offer of the Austrian tradition that uh, helps us with understanding Bitcoin is Hayek mm -hmm. and his take on um, what prices actually are. Mm -hmm. And uh, my probably all-time favorite uh, piece of writing on economics is his uh, The use, use of Knowledge in Society. Oh, I love that paper. Yeah. yeah. Where he explains that uh, prices are like um, the most elegant way for us to coordinate, to share knowledge in between each other. Mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, least amount of necessary information, the yeah. least amount of information. Yeah. It's just uh, just a digit, yeah. just uh, just the price. It's like the ultimate form of data compression, right. right? Yeah. In terms of moving knowledge or preferences around the world in just one number, yeah. Versus a story or words or anything, yeah. Yeah. And Hayek uh, and Mises himself uh, point out that uh, there might be a temptation to try to. Um, control that. that uh, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of interesting that uh, I believe it's Mises who pointed out that even if we had like total supercomputers with uh, 
uh, magnificent uh, computing power, mm. you still wouldn't be able to replace the pricing system right. and the price signals because uh, the knowledge is distributed. Mm -hmm. It changes all the time. Mm -hmm. It's uh, um, very much uh, based on uh, local circumstances and mm. our perception of these local circumstances. That's right. And uh, the only way to properly uh, coordinate is the pricing mechanism. Yeah. And the Hayek... Uh, before he became an economist, he studied uh, the emergent systems and the uh, price system, as well as many other human institutions, are uh, an emergent phenomenon. Uh, so it's a, it's a result of human action, but not of human design. And if you try to design it uh, with some top-down uh, power-based approach, you disrupt the system and you destroy uh, its qualities. And uh, it's, for example, Soviet uh, economy or Communist economies, they had uh, like nominal prices, but they were meaningless because they didn't have this emergent quality. Right. So uh, how, what does this have to do with Bitcoin? But mm. uh, for us to get rid of the, the destructive uh, business cycle mm. and for the prices to work as intended, yes. as, as they should, we need uh, a proper foundation of on which it rests. And that's incorruptible, incorruptible money. That's money that acts as a sort of anchor of mm -hmm. the economy. Um, so it needs to have a predictable and immutable monetary policy, mm -hmm. or actually no monetary policy at all, because mm -hmm. Bitcoin, it's not a policy. It's all, but it sets that. Right, right. So um, it's more like a immutable issuance schedule, yeah, right? right? That you opt in or opt out of. Yeah. yeah. There's no discussion around that. It just, right. it just is. Yeah. And uh, that's what money should be. For for a long time, gold has been like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not perfect yeah. uh, because uh, the issuance schedule isn't really predictable and mm -hmm. unchangeable. But it used to be like one to three percent a year. Yeah. And uh, coincidentally, this is probably why we have uh, the two percent inflation target uh, that the central bank set. There's uh, they inherited it from gold. Yeah. They yeah. 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 There's yes. no like uh, reason. For that, other right. than it used to be like that with just gold. arbitrary and inherited, one hundred percent. Just to echo the point on yeah. price signals, it, this is one of those domains that's pretty abstract. It's hard for people to understand how important pricing really is. Um, I think Hayek's paper, "The Use of Knowledge in Society," is one of the best pieces I've ever read about it. Uh, there's also a really good description in the Bitcoin Standard by Safedean. He's got a probably two-page passage on it. It's very, very yeah. brilliantly written. I think a good analogy might be uh, it's distributed computing versus centralized computing, right? And it doesn't matter how powerful that central computing mechanism is, like how smart your bureaucrats are, well, no matter what hardware or software they are running, it simply can never have as much data throughput as a distributed computing system where each market actor is acting on the knowledge relevant to their specific time and place yeah. and not passing it into the central server and back, which is just a loss of efficiency, relevance, timing, et cetera. It's um, each individual acting on uh, the prices and information available to them and those actions in turn feed the price. Yeah. So it's this, it's this constantly dynamically updating distributed computing system that we get called the pricing system and it's condensing all market realities, all known information relevant to any specific commodity in the marketplace into one single number. Yeah. And as the number moves, that's all you need to know, right? If the number goes up, if I'm a consumer, I'm incentivized to consume less. If I'm a producer, I'm incentivized to produce more and vice versa if the number moves down. And so it's a when you see it that way, it's like this very beautiful emergent structure. And then any attempt to plan that, control that, bureaucratize that actually destroys that decentralized computing system and throws uh, human interaction into disarray, basically. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, the, the, the emergent price is the signal. If you replace that with uh, something you make up uh, in some bureau, uh, that's not the signal. It's just the noise. That's right. That's right. And there you go. Like, maybe uh, you rightly pointed out it's uh, kind of abstract and hard, hard for people to understand mm -hmm. that. Uh, one good comparison, I think, is uh, with language, and yes. the hike was like making this comparison. Maybe even more important than language. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, we have a very good analogy in in uh, in a language uh, sphere where uh, we have a lingua franca that's English right now. Mm -hmm. Used to be other languages, but that that's always emergent. Like what mm -hmm. kind of language becomes uh, the dominant uh, yes. language? Uh, and there have been attempts to replace that with a top-down construct with Esperanto. Mm -hmm. And uh, it totally fit. Like it mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. like it's logical. It's a nice uh, logical construct. Uh, English has a lot of like nonsensical rules okay. in there. Esperanto is really like nicely constructed, but uh, it totally failed in replacing uh, this messy uh, bottom-up emergent uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon, phenomenon, which is the English language. Yeah. And uh, that's a I believe uh, like a good comparison to the emergent prices and the top-down central planning. Yes. It just doesn't work because, and it doesn't even work in uh, things like uh, language or there were attempts to replace uh, like the QWERTY layout of the keyboard, yes. the Dvorak. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. these things simply never work because right. um, for some reason um, there are these emergent phenomenons and uh, when they took over, when they become like the shelling point of, uh, yeah. of their particular field, it's very hard to replace them. And if you try that, uh, you will uh, make so much collateral damage. Yes, yes. P you know, people are not cogs in a machine, right? You can't just yeah. turn them from English to Esperanto or whatever. It's like people have their own choices. And you, you almost have to respect the complexity of that system and give individuals autonomy. And then the emergent uh, phenomena from that from respecting individual autonomy is the thing that works best uh, right. typically. Yeah. So, and so it's almost like a central planner's fallacy, right? That they, they, they treat the, what does Taleb say? Confusing the cat for the washing machine. Mm -hmm. They think people are like mechanistic or controllable, but in reality we're dynamic, we're complex, we're unpredictable basically. So you have to uh, have a reverence, I think for emergent reality and um, understand that your, your knowledge or your, central plan is always inferior to what nature produces spontaneously. Yeah. Uh, if I may, if you can stay on, on, on that topic. Yes. Um, one other like good comparison is uh, with natural laws. Mm. Some people have this tendency to think that economic laws are sort of um, mutable or malleable. You can, mm -hmm. uh, you can, right. uh, you can adjust them, but uh, it works with the same, uh, like there's no discussion about their uh, workings right. uh, just as uh, there's no discussion with for example gravity you yes. need to adjust to the fact that gravity uh, is simply here on this planet yes. and uh, you can um, you can use it for your advantage yes uh, you can still fly you can still like use that but uh, uh, you cannot fly by like flapping your arms right the right. same way right. uh, right. You can, let's say... It's like you can't create wealth by printing money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. As brand. Yeah. 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 No, great. Great stuff. These these are immutable laws of human action. Like man must act. Man prefers present satisfaction to later satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think many of us would argue many of the problems in the world today are, come because we ignore those laws. Right. Under the Keynesian economic paradigm. Yeah. Um, okay. Good stuff. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. 
The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Bitcoin and time preference, which is the second chapter of your book. Time preference, very popular concept in Bitcoin circles, thanks to, thanks to Safedean's book largely. Uh, but very, again, one of those things that's opaque to most people in the world. You say time preference, people have no idea what you're talking about. So what is time preference? And what does Bitcoin have to do with it? So the concept of time preference, uh, I believe it's uh, one of the most important insights uh, of um, economics. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important for even like ordinary people to understand because it can really change, uh, change uh, your life. It can turn your life around once you understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so in short, uh, time preference is the rate at which we discount the future. So the, uh, if we say uh, we have a high time preference, that means we highly discount the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and I prefer to consume and act uh, right now in the present mm -hmm. and in the short, uh, short mm -hmm. uh, term time frames. And if you have a low time preference, that means I don't discount the future as much. Uh, I consider it very important. And uh, I, for example, uh, don't drink, I exercise more, mm -hmm. I save my money for the future. And um, so... What does it have to do with Bitcoin is uh, if your if the money itself is corrupt and mm -hmm. if it has this inbuilt uh, inflation rate where mm -hmm. uh, it's programmed to rob us of uh, the purchasing power by 2% or 5 or 10% a year, that means uh, we discount the future uh, at least by that rate, by mm -hmm. at least that much. So... Uh, if instead of uh, the purchasing power staying the same for me mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years, it's uh, uh, being uh, debased, debased yes. by 10% a year, mm -hmm. I won't uh, like to save in this type of instrument uh, for too long. Because mm -hmm. if I save uh, for 10 years, I'm going to lose uh, most of the purchasing power. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if uh, the purchasing power is increasing because, for example, the money is sound and the productivity is increasing, so the prices go down and my purchasing power is increasing, I will save much more and I will tend to invest in um, companies and stuff that will mm -hmm. generate some uh, small uh, revenue for me and uh, I will be comfortable with that. I'm not uh, hunting for some large yields that uh, need to overcome this uh, debasement. Mm. So... Again, uh, gold, uh, gold and silver, like the commodity money that were scarce, uh, they, uh, whenever uh, so society used the gold and silver money and the, the coinage wasn't debased, mm -hmm. uh, these were like the high points of, uh, of uh, mankind. So uh, the Roman Empire, uh, mm -hmm. before the debasement started, uh, I have that in the book around uh, like 0 AD, Mm -hmm. The basement really took off and uh, they destroyed the currency in like 300 years. Mm -hmm. So before that, that was like the high point of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Then the Byz Byzantine Empire, uh, that was here for like almost 1,000 year, years, years without any debasement. Uh, then, you know, the city-states in Italy, like, uh, 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 was it Genoa? And uh, Florence, uh, mm -hmm. like the Renaissance period. Uh, yeah. all, always like a sound money... Uh, Sound money society. Yeah, and uh, so for for the past one hundred years, when uh, the bankers and the politicians found a way how to circumvent that, how to uh, create money out of nothing, how mm -hmm. to uh, get rid of uh, the money and silver from from the equation, mm -hmm. uh, we have seen like uh, the fiercest wars, mm -hmm. the fiercest totalitarian regimes, mm -hmm. uh, the the fiercest famines. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, uh, slavery, like yeah. in China in some parts, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe this is very much a result of uh, of corrupt money and of uh, really high time preference. Yes, yeah. yeah, this is. Um, I, I I think 
I gave a keynote on it yesterday, but one of the deepest insights I've had about going into the Bitcoin rabbit hole is this relationship between the characteristics of the money and then the characteristics of the users of the money, actually. And it seems like a lot of that relationship is mediated through time preference, um, which again, is just it's kind of the rate at which you prefer the present to the future, right? So if you if you're much more present oriented, I always think of the analogy of like just the caveman, right? Where he's just trying to eat whatever he can and find a mate and go to sleep. Extremely high time preference. He doesn't care about the future at all. He's just trying to like get by, meal to meal, mate to mate, whatever. Yeah. And versus a civilization, right? Where we have capital and savings and cooperation and rule of law and all of these things that let us actually plan into the future. And all of a sudden we don't have to discount the future quite so much. We can, yeah. we can operate with a higher concern for the future which is to say operating with a higher concern for our future selves and others in the future. So it's, it's almost the definition of civilization is to lower our time preference. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, he has uh, this uh, really great term um, that um, the low time preference is the process of civilization. Exactly. And uh, it's very, very much tied to the nature of money. Yeah. You cannot have uh, a civilized society uh, with the broken money. That's right. That's right. You could almost say that the integrity of the money supply and the integrity of civilization itself are inexorably bound. Yeah. Like if you start to debase the money, as we've seen historically, we've got plenty of empirical examples of this. We also have plenty of theory right from the Austrian school, Austrian mm -hmm. business cycle theory, which you mentioned that explains this. The extent to which you debase the monetary protocol is the extent to which political protocols fail is the extent to which civilization fails ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And like an interesting uh, insight is also that uh, we'll always have uh, some positive time preference because we are mortal. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are some interesting uh, consequences. For example, a lot of times people that misunderstand Bitcoin and nature of money mm -hmm. think that uh, if we are on a sound money standard, um, the, the economy will come to a halt because we will uh, we will we won't discount the future at all, and we won't uh, basically have any economic activity right now because, right. because we will all just save our money and wait. For so silly. Humans it's obviously silly. love to silly. consume. We're consuming right now, right? We're sitting in a building, yeah, because we need breathing air, we're eating food. Yeah, we do it all the time. We we're wearing clothes, right? But uh, yeah, so uh, what what would happen is. Uh, the, the structure of uh, goods and services that's produced would be uh, shifted, would be different than what mm -hmm. it is now. We would, uh, for example, um, prefer stuff that uh, remains for longer, that yes. lasts. Yes. That's the quality. Yes. quality. Yes. But uh, we would still be consumers. Yes. We'd still use computers and phones, but uh, perhaps you would need to replace them like every year. Yeah. The life cycle would be higher uh, yes. longer yes and uh, uh yeah and the same with like clothes food stuff like that yeah so uh the, the economy doesn't come to a halt it actually becomes much more healthy and much more aligned with uh with long-term planning right? yes yes and you would see this reflected in the architectural yeah. um okay. paradigms of hard money societies yeah. right they're building buildings yeah. that take centuries to build etc et right cetera. yeah you can see that uh, all, uh, all around Prague like yes sound yes. architecture yes. just before the architecture just before uh first world war it's one of the best in the world much better yeah because that was like uh the, the the peak of uh European civilization basically yes. just before world war one yeah, and one of the most refreshing things coming from the United States to Europe for me is to see that because in the U.S. we don't really have anything like that. I mean, we have some, but not not as ancient as you guys do mm, in Europe, yeah. which is super cool. Okay, going into uh, third chapter here, Bitcoin and monetary history. I'm sure there's, uh, obviously Bitcoin has a lot to do with monetary history, given it's the latest chapter <laughs> in the story of monetary history. Um, maybe we could focus this question on like, why gold? Why did gold become money of all the things that we've been trying across history? And w how does Bitcoin then slot into that as maybe the next chapter beyond gold? Right. I believe um, the most important um, function of money is to preserve value mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, in a sufficiently developed society mm -hmm. with a high uh, division of labor and complexity, uh, people wouldn't need to work as much if they were only to um, satisfy their present needs. So uh, 
but but it's much better for the society if, uh, for example, a blacksmith works for eight hours instead of one. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a blacksmith, he would need to maybe work just for an, for one hour to get the food he needs for the yes. day. Right. So uh, the way for the society to incentivize uh, the blacksmith to work for the full uh, working day is for him to be able to save and to maybe save up for a nicer house, a uh, nicer car, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, he needs money that uh, retains the value. Uh -huh. uh, and not just for tomorrow or week after it, but maybe for, for years uh -huh. or for decades, because uh -huh. uh, he wants to save up for, for his children. Uh -huh. So um, that's why uh, the store of value fu function of money is uh, the most important for, for money itself. Uh -huh. And the other functions, like minimum of exchange and unit of account, they are basically like logically following that. Mm -hmm. uh, and gold uh, as a uh, very scarce metal, very scarce element, that's also quite easily found uh, all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not limited to just one place in, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Earth's crust, but it's quite uh, well uh, uh, divided, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, distributed. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's uh, and it's also like uh, easily um, you can smelt it and you can uh, coin it into uh, because it's a soft metal but it's scarce mm -hmm. at the same time and uh, it's um, uh, it, do it doesn't rust right yes so basically indestructible it's indestructible yeah, yeah. so uh, it has this like good set of uh, physical qualities mm -hmm. that uh, led to all the societies that uh, came into contact with gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and had the abilities to create a coinage out of that mm. uh, to adopt it uh, as as uh, as money. Yes, yeah. I think it comes back to what you said earlier that you know preserving value is the number one function. The flip side of preserving value is knowing that someone's not going to arbitrarily compromise the supply. Right? That it has a high degree of supply integrity. And that's what enables something to preserve value over time. So it's like we've been searching and experimenting with all these different monetary technologies across time. And we found that, well, it turns out gold was the closest thing we had to that ideal yeah. of a fixed supply money, right? It was the most relatively scarce commodity that otherwise exhibited good monetary properties. So gold became money. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also through that lens is a good aperture through which to evaluate Bitcoin's value going into the future. Yeah. So um, in the chapter Bitcoin and Monetary History, I point out that whenever uh, the state uh, became involved in uh, the definition of money, mm -hmm. in the issuance of money, uh, it always used it, uh, used it as a leverage to plunder from the productive society. Yes. Uh, to legal plunder, as legal plunder. Yeah. it. Yeah. So legal plunder. Uh, and it's very, um, in effect, it's a very sophisticated way to uh, to loot uh, the value from mm -hmm. the productive society because you don't uh, go around like robbing people mm -hmm. uh, uh, like that. But uh, you like the the most um, simple way to do that is to basically take in uh, take in the coins, uh, lower the gold content, and issue the new coins with the same nominal value. Yes, uh, that's like the original form of uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, many currencies throughout the history are basically destroyed like that because once you set on this path, uh, it's very hard to go back from that. And mm -hmm. usually, it leads to a total, uh, total um, undermining of the currency in several hundred years. Yeah, what Mises said: there's only one of two possible outcomes once you start on the path of debasement. Right? It's either hyperinflation or you let the currency deflationarily crash back to where it right. where it was before you started. And so. Right. Two bad outcomes, yeah. basically. So, so going back to uh, gold and uh, the states involvement in in that, um, gold, as we said, has a really good set of physical qualities that make it good money. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, it is physical, and it yes. requires uh, it requires intermediaries, mm -hmm. banks, and the state or the ruler to first. Um, validate that it's really gold mm -hmm. and that some particular coin has, for example, 90% mm -hmm. uh, purity. And uh, second, to transfer it efficiently uh, for um, for some distance. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, quite expensive and risky to just carry around the gold coins or right. gold bars. So that's why uh, banks emerged and uh, 
Or is it uh, Nick Batial, your money? Yeah, that's yes, brilliant yes, group yes. and this yeah. story and yeah. how it emerged. And it's uh, it's a very logical consequence of gold being physical. Yes. Yeah, it requires counterparties to scale. Yeah. Right? Because you, you need to centralize the custody to make it efficient as a transactional medium. And therein lies the problem, right? We yeah. trusted third parties are security holes, as Nick Zabo said. Right. Um, so gold, in my opinion, gold culminates in fiat currency. It's like inevitable. You put that much power in one place, people are going to abuse the trust before you, you go from full reserve to fractional reserve to zero reserve fiat currency. And here we are in 2023, um, living through the latest iteration of that. So yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's, and, uh, that's what Bitcoin fixes Yeah, because it's intangible and, um, uh, for some people, that's a, that's a point of critique that it's intangible, mm -hmm. so it cannot, uh, it's nothing real, but right. uh, it's uh, it's a feature, it's not its bug. Yes. Uh, it, uh, the, the intangibility of Bitcoin fixes uh, gold's problems. Exactly. Because then yeah. we don't need the intermediaries. Right. Yeah, it's a step closer to the ideal of money, because money is just this agreement between people. Yeah. Um, ideally, that agreement would be something non-corporeal, right? It doesn't need a physical substance per se but needs to be rooted in physical reality so you don't debase the supply, yes. which is the brilliance of proof of work mining. It really is brilliant. Yes. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Okay, now we're into the title of the book. Bitcoin, separation of money and state. I think many people in the West have heard of the movement, the separation of church and state in history books, but what is the separation of money and state and how is Bitcoin related? Right. So I make the case for why we actually need uh, the, to separate money from the state. And that's uh, mostly as a result of uh, our insight uh, into money, mm -hmm. into why why we need money, why uh, we need sound money, uh, why uh, the state's involvement in money always leads to its corruption. So we have that uh, understanding that we need to separate the money from the state. Mm -hmm. And now the question is uh, how that will um, proceed. And uh, as we pointed out, uh, the economic laws work um, with the same um, reliability as natural laws. Mm -hmm. So I believe when we have uh, Bitcoin as uh, this like, instrument that's very close to perfect money, uh, the individuals, the economy will gradually uh, gravitate toward that. So we will adopt that. And uh, the adoption um, will proceed first from uh, like the most important function of money, which is store of value. So for the individuals, uh, they will find out that uh, storing their value in Bitcoin is uh, much better over long, long terms than storing it in fiat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe in storing it in a real estate or stock or gold or gold or bonds. Uh, because Bitcoin, 
uh, isn't tied to any particular jurisdiction. And for example, in Czech Republic and uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, uh, in general, people tend to save mostly in real estate. But the problem is it's very easily taxable and uh, it's not very liquid if you need to li- uh, if you need to sell it, uh, especially if there is some crisis under duress. Yeah, if you need to leave the country. So um, and we have actually, um, unfortunately, we have a good example of that, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine mm. and the real estate in Ukraine, especially in the in the cities that were uh, really like uh, hit by uh, by the invasion. Uh, it's illiquid and it probably lost uh, like most of its value, mm-hmm. ba- basically overnight. Mm-hmm. So the only way to preserve your wealth in this uh, situation is through something like Bitcoin. And it's mm-hmm. uh, probably the, the safest way. Right here at the conference, we had a panel on uh, Bitcoin in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And the problem for a lot of people in Ukraine was that uh, there was a limit on how much uh, cash they can bring out of the country, mm-hmm. which is $10,000. But if you have a... Mm-hmm. If you have a house, you are lucky enough to sell it for one hundred thousand dollars. You would need to make ten trips, and chances are you will get robbed during that. So, uh, Bitcoin uh, is a great store of value over the long term, and uh, it carries actually much less risk than the other instruments that we use as a store of value right now. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, the Another example, I recovered real estate, but mm-hmm. for, uh, for example, the uh, the bonds are very sensitive to the uh, the interest rates. Mm-hmm. So they are, uh, their market prices reflect the uh, the, uh, the the central planning that's that's happening. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the United States bonds have recently lost like uh, tens of percent in their valuation just because of the actions of the central bank. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bitcoin isn't tied to any like decision uh, maker like that. Mm-hmm. It's really global, and over the long term, there there might be like some short term uh, volatility because of uh, some central bank action. But mm-hmm. in, in the on, in the long term, it doesn't matter. In the long term, Bitcoin's valuation is just a reflection of uh, the uh, monetary algorithm of Bitcoin versus monetary policy of all the fiat currencies. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's completely opposite. Monetary algorithm of Bitcoin is uh, like diminishing over the long term until the mm-hmm. one million, and the monetary policy of uh, all the fiat currencies is basically exponential. Right. So, uh, and uh, I believe uh, as the knowledge uh, about Bitcoin spreads throughout the society, like to what we do, yeah, uh, to education, to uh, necessity, mm-hmm. um, Bitcoin will tend to be adopted as this uh, non-state money uh, first because of its store of value function. Mm. Uh, in some places like Africa, where uh, money doesn't work as a store of value, but doesn't work even as a medium of exchange because they don't have uh, like the ability to do uh, digital payments, mm-hmm. it's starting to work even uh, as a medium of exchange right now, like mm-hmm. Africa, uh, South Africa, yes. Algeria. Right. Uh, so uh, like it's uh, it's an emerging phenomenon. It, uh, I don't believe it really matters if any state uh, like allows it or uh, makes it a legal tender. Mm-hmm. That uh, they may slightly accelerate it or de- mm-hmm. accelerate it, but it's uh, the separation of money and state is, I believe, unstoppable and uh, an emergent phenomenon that's happening all around the world. Yeah. And uh, it's inevitable because the economic laws and the incentives of uh, individuals and later maybe even companies and yeah. uh, and uh, the governments uh, will, uh, like, it cannot lead to anything else than right. separation of money and state. Yeah, yeah, as sure as gravity pulls things down to earth, right? That these natural laws hold and individuals that seek to preserve purchasing power over time will kind of be forced into using Bitcoin at some point. Um, that's the general theory, at least. Uh, yeah. So far, so good. 14 years into Bitcoin's history. Okay. Next chapter is why Bitcoin only. Um, I guess we could translate this into why Bitcoin, not shitcoin, which yeah. is a point of confusion for most people that get into Bitcoin, right? They come into Bitcoin and they get lost in the shitcoin jungle. And typically through pain and loss, they come back to Bitcoin only. Um, how do you articulate the case for Bitcoin only? So um, I give the example of... Uh 
the projects that preceded Bitcoin, which are mm. uh, which is stuff like um, eGold, eBillion, Liberty Reserve, Liberty Dollar, mm. uh, which were all centralized, and mm. it was very easy uh, for the state to shut it down and to uh, jail uh, the founders and to confiscate all the value from those projects. And th that is basically what happened to all of those projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe Satoshi understood that very well, that uh, mm -hmm. that risk that it can be shut down. And if the founder is known, he can be coerced or he can uh, be uh, like leveraged uh, as a tool of uh, control for mm -hmm. that system. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, like uh, Satoshi's brilliance in foreseeing that danger is really something remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if we want, we need to separate money and state. We need uh, uh, the alternative to be decentralized, to to have no uh, point of control, no mm -hmm. single point of failure. And it turns out it's actually very hard to create such system. Uh, and it's actually very hard to create that uh, once uh, there is already something existing. Mm -hmm. To create a decentralized system after uh, Bitcoin emerged and after Bitcoin began to be adopted uh, is, I believe, almost impossible. Because to compete with that, uh, either you create like the same thing, but it's uh, uh, why would I adopt that if there is Bitcoin already? Why would I create, uh, mm -hmm. adopt the clone? or you need to differentiate it somehow. So what uh, the altcoins, shitcoins do is uh, they create some kind of complexity, mm -hmm. uh, maybe higher transaction throughput, mm -hmm. some, um, how do you call it, uh, Turing completeness, yeah. uh, some uh, new advanced cryptography. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that makes it more complicated, uh, that makes it harder for people to run the nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, it also makes it uh, more susceptible to bugs. So there, yeah. there's a need for for updates of that system, which all tends to centralize the system. Right. So um, the question why Bitcoin only is because uh, we need the system to be decentralized. Only Bitcoin was able to get to that level, uh, most in great part because of how it emerged and that yes. it didn't have any price in the beginning and we could uh, solve the initial box without yeah. any financial motive. Uh, and the other systems are mm, basically impossible. It's impossible for, for them to uh, achieve that. Yeah, it's uh, this is a complicated domain, right? It has to do with path dependence, first yeah. mover advantage, it has to do with Bitcoin's simplicity, I yes. think as well, just minimal attack surface, mm -hmm. minimal feature set, um, which people might interpret that, you know, What's the uh, the critique often wielded of Bitcoin? It's old technology. It's like it moves too slow. It's like you want sound money to be really boring, really slow exactly. moving, really reliable. Money like, needs to be boring. Yes, these are all features, not bugs, without a doubt. Um, okay, great points. I want to just finish by reading. At the end of the book, you have the Ten Commandments of Bitcoin. Right. Um, so I'll just read through these, and then I'll, I'll let you provide some commentary. First commandment, thou shalt not show thy seed or shamir to thy neighbor. Thou shalt keep thy satoshi in a hardware wallet. Thou shalt keep only change in thy mobile wallet. Thou shalt withdraw thy satoshi from the exchange immediately after purchasing. Thou shalt give preference to dollar cost averaging over soothsaying of market trends. It is forbidden to stack so strongly that you grow fearful of a price drop. Thou shalt buy on the dip, not selleth. Thou shalt resist the temptation of altcoins as they are a trap of the devil, eager to take thy sats. Thou shalt check well the address when sending, since the malware demons lurk behind every corner. Thou shalt refrain from boasting of the size of thy stack. Thou shalt give preference to hold, holding over trading. Pretty good set of commandments there. Right. So I wanted um, for the reader to um, come away with some practical tips mm -hmm. on how to approach Bitcoin. So if you, if you understand that we need to separate money and state, um, some people like might have uh, this good intention. Okay, so I'm going to start stacking. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if they do that on an exchange, 
uh, and if they keep like watching the price and maybe panic and mm, get this idea that I'm gonna sell high and buy low, mm -hmm. uh, usually they will end up with uh, you either no Bitcoin in the end or much less Bitcoin mm -hmm. than they started with. So uh, just to uh, give them something to think about. Uh, I had the idea to, okay, so either I can write it down like uh, normally, but mm -hmm. it won't stick in your head, mm -hmm. it won't stick in your mind then. So I uh, had this idea to do it like in this um, peculiar way of the commandments, like uh, with this biblical mm -hmm. sort of language, mm -hmm. uh, so that it sort of sticks. And some people criticize that and say, okay, the Bitcoin really is a cult if they are... Uh, <laughs> writing down these commandments, but uh, it's quite effective for people. Like they, they uh, remember it. Yes. And uh, a lot of like readers of this book uh, in Czech Republic, because it was Czech up until now, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, heed those commandments. They, yeah. uh, they listen to that and uh, stack it in the hardware wallet. They don't follow the price. They don't get lured by shitcoin. Yeah. Uh, they DCA. And yeah, it's very uh, rewarding for me to meet people after several years and uh, uh, they usually thank me for um, yeah. for uh, not being affected by stuff like FTX, Luna, and, yeah. and, and all this bullshit that happened over the last year. That must feel really good to yeah. have helped people, steer people clear of all that. And like the Ten Commandments, I think these Ten Commandments can help you avoid a lot of heartache and pain if you follow them closely. So... Joseph, thank you. This is the book, Bitcoin, The Separation of Money and State. Um, really appreciate you coming on the show today. Where can people find you on the internet? So the best place would be uh, on Twitter at Sats Joseph. Boom. And I Love also it. contribute to Bitcoin Magazine under my name, Joseph Chetek. Okay. We'll link to all that in the show notes. Thank you again for doing this. Thank you for the opportunity. All right.